Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second session of ICES's inaugural TCI week. Um, very welcome to join us for this, the, the, the first event uh, of its kind uh, for trade credit insurance under ICESA. We've, we've run similar events for surety, but we're pleased to be opening up the trade credit insurance sector uh, this month. There's an awful lot happening in the world, and we believe that trade credit insurance has a, a really important role to play within that. And of course, one of the most important parts of that is the role that credit insurance plays alongside financing partners, so banks and factors and, and, and other financial institutions. So we're extremely pleased to present a, um, a panel discussion of uh, some excellent experts uh, on, on this topic from both the insurer side, the banking side, the broker side, um, and I'm sure you'll be really impressed. Uh, the overall topic is is why financial institutions use credit insurers, the challenges, the, the, the changes and opportunities. But I'm sure you'll see that it's uh, quite a diverse discussion that's coming up. Um, some of our uh, speakers were not able to attend today, so we've pre-recorded this discussion. But there will be a, a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions as we're going along for any of the panelists, please feel free to drop them into the questions tab um, at the bottom right of the screen. Uh, we'll just start the recording now and uh, I hope you enjoy it and look forward to seeing you again and, and answering some of your questions at the end of the panel. Thank you. Hello, my name is Audrey Zook. I run a consultancy called A to Z Risk Services and I'm pleased to introduce a panel that has a perspective from many angles on the use of credit insurance by financial institution including users and providers of the single situation, as well as multi-buyer or whole turnover product. We've got Katie Fowler from the Texel Group, a broker, Laurent Gorevich from Kufas, an insurer, Marilyn Blattner-Hoyle from Swiss Re on the insurance rather than the reinsurance side, Annel Berry from Alliance Trade, also an insurer, and Jean-Maurice Elkoby from ING Bank. We're here to discuss why financial institutions use credit insurance. It's a product that has performed well, as demonstrated last year by recent data that over US, two, uh, US $1 billion uh, in claims were paid in that year alone in a wide range of sectors, regions, and transaction types. But it's a product that's not very well understood always. Katie, as someone who works with banks to get them comfortable with credit insurance, what concerns do you run across and how do you address them? Thank you, Audrey. So as a broker, when I speak to new clients and I try and demystify the non-payment insurance product and I talk to them about why other banks are using the product, they're really interested to hear. Uh, what their competitors are, are doing, because I just don't think they want to be left behind. So there's some really good data out there, and you don't have to just listen uh, to my opinions, but there's data from the IACPM and ITFA non-payment survey that was conducted last year. And they asked the financial institution participants why they're using the product. The, the number one reason that they came back with was to cover credit exposures to increase lending capacity while complying with internal credit limits. So I think this is really a reflection of uh, the, the members of ITFA. So they're doing a lot of short-term trade finance business, um, you know, bank to bank and uh, receivable financing. So I think those, if you're covering those types of product, that you're maybe doing it more for, for the, the limits. But the second reason I think it's really important is to attain capital relief and it enables financial institutions to reduce RWAs and to manage capital more efficiently. So Jean-Maurice from ING has done amazing work on the regulatory committee at IFA, and uh, so he's, he's our expert and, and might touch up upon the, the topic a bit later on. The third uh, important reason why, why banks are, are purchasing the product is to increase final take and hold commitments. So one of the great reasons, uh, you know, one of the reasons why the, the product is so, so brilliant is that it is silent. So the banks are able to hold larger final, final gross loan commitments whilst internally booking a lower net exposure to the borrower. 
So our clients are able to take lead positions in facilities. The sophisticated users of the product are actually, they're not so much concerned with the credit risk themselves, that they love the risk, they want to do more of it. They want to distribute in order to do more business on the origination side. I think a lot of banks have talked about an originate to distribute model, but there was a bank on a recent panel who talked about distribute to originate, which I thought was interesting. I'd say the fourth reason is to enhance loan economics. So insurance premium is usually priced as a share of the insured's net margin, i.e. after treasury costs are removed from the gross margin. And this allows the bank to skim on the premium paid and also retain the upfront fee um, on the whole loan. So that, that is, uh, and this isn't shared with underwriters at all. What is shared is perhaps commitment fees or unutilized fees, but not the upfront fees. So we then go on to uh, another reason, the fifth reason, which is to manage concentration risk, whether it's counterparty or country concentration. And this can be mitigated for the use of non-payment insurance, which can have an impact on the, balance, the bank's balance sheet and external ratings due to the actual reduction in country or borrower uh, concentration exposure. So we find that some of our clients have um, you know, regions where they specialize in and they're really comfortable with that risk, but they might want to do a deal that sits outside their comfort zone and they've got to get their credit committees on board. And this is where insurance can provide that additional level of comfort. I do want to stress that in the single situation uh, market that uh, the counterparties we're looking at are much more on the double B plus side rather than the single B and the buyers are using the market in a very programmatic fashion and very much as a continued partnership. So the next reason is the growth in core clients. Um, uh, sorry, the growth with core clients and the bank's able to grow its loan exposure to its core clients without increasing its net exposure to these entities. And I think during COVID, we saw our clients really trying to su support their, their core clients. And with the commodity price volatility too, they wanted to support in particular their, their trader clients who are really important to their business. Another reason, number seven, I'd say, is probably it's more applicable to the multilateral development banks who are entering our market uh, in the recent years more, more and more and buying the product. And they can use it to optimize external ratings. So rating agencies such as Fitch have actually commented on, uh, for instance, TDBs, Trading Development Banks, um, use of the product. They say the bank's loan portfolio is secured largely with credit insurance, 34% from A to AA rated underwriters, which uh, I think is, is very interesting. The last reason that I want to mention is probably, again, more applicable to those covering securitizations. Uh, again, a growing part of our market, and it m can mobilize institutional capital. Attracts institutional capital, particularly on portfolio structures where mezzanine or senior insured tranche can be implemented. And those last two reasons, the optimizing external ratings and mobilizing institutional capital might not be applicable to, if you are a financial institution, to your institution, but, they, but those are drivers uh, that have an impact on our market. And really, it's an increase in demand of insurance, uh, whether it's on single names or countries or particular sectors. And on the flip side, there's actually more supply coming into the market. So we've got more underwriters uh, entering in. And um, I was speaking to an underwriter today who's seeing Lots more deals, lots more exciting deals, uh, really attractive um, transactions that they wish to support. There's definitely more entrance into the market than that in the last years, and there has been withdrawing. And there's lots of options for the banks, as well as lots of reasons that I've talked about to, to buy the product. And I just want to echo what Audrey said at the beginning about that claims data 
they come back and they keep buying the product because it works. It's paid out. And um, yeah, I'll, I will leave it at that and pass over to uh, back to Audrey. Thanks, Katie. Um, Jean-Marie, as a banker, you may have something um, you want to add to, to Katie's excellent list of, of uh, points. But um, Katie, you mentioned multilaterals as users. And, and Loho, I know your uh, institution does a lot with other financial institutions. We tend to think about banks a lot as being as being the the, the world of, of financial institutions. But um, before I go into Jean-Marie, do you want to mention some of the other kind of financial institutions that you work with? Yeah, thanks, Audrey. And thanks, Katie. You, you, you did a, a great summary. And but, but maybe sh we should to remind to everyone that the, the bulk of our business and the bulk of revenue with banks uh, is done based on short-term credit insurance, meaning that we are dealing with factor of the factoring arms of the banks. And this is where we are really focusing for the time being because this is an obvious uh, good binome between the factor and the TCI providers. And in this perspective, we can say that the factors are fueling the economy with cash and uh, the TCI providers are fueling the economy with trust because we are covering the, de the, the final debtors and the banks is really focusing on the seller, meaning their own customer. And this binome is quite well um, known and uh, is dealing this way for over the last 20 years, I would say. And uh, the business is still growing quite fast because factoring is the most, is a more and more popular uh, product for even large corporates. Um, so I would say that the banking uh, environment is full of uh, opportunities from loans to short-term credit, meaning from loans to very short-term receivable, for example. Jean-Maurice, you're nodding. You must uh, agree with that point then. Yeah, no, I, indeed, yes. Um, I think, well done, Katie. That's a really comprehensive list of uh, benefits and, and quite a compelling one. Um, I would just add, since we're setting the scene uh, right now for the audience, is also the fact that, indeed, as Laurent said, it applies to virtually every asset that a bank may have. You know, so loans is, is what I do. That there are colleagues that do uh, receivables uh, with uh, uh, the good gentlemen that are on the panel, like Laurent and Anil. Um, the, um, you know, you can do swaps, you can do even operational risk of the bank is something that you can insure with private insurers. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, you, you have, um, uh, here we're talking about comprehensive uh, private risk insurance. So um, it's really a risk transfer instrument. It's an alternative to a cash sale uh, in a syndication uh, uh, context or a secondary uh, trade. Uh, and it's very different from PRI, which is just political risk insurance and, and insures uh, defined perils. Uh, so that that's um, very different. And it can be done also in, in various ways there are um, uh, the, the bulk of what is uh, the, of the business is done with an indemnity product which is an insurance policy uh, but there are also um, insurers or often these are the reinsurers that can propose um, a risk participation agreement which then are very familiar uh, with uh, for with bankers and uh, with less um, uh, a little bit less conditionality, even though we we don't make a difference between the two. Um, yeah. I wanted to go back to something that Laurent mentioned, which was the the growth and demand and the in the market growth. And um, from your perspective, where do you how how have you seen demand evolve, and are, do you see differences in in regions, for example, in terms of the use or the demand growth for the product? Laurent. Yeah, well, there are, in terms of uh, demand evolution, I would say that there are three kinds of reasons why the demand is moving from from the 2019 to uh, the, the current situation. First, there is still the classic need for transfer risk. And this is the very basis of, uh, of uh, the, the demand. And um, this works quite well. And this is something that where the, the, the insurer are very um, 
good at it. I mean, uh, we have a lot of expertise, we have a lot of information of the debtors, so we can provide a lot of cover on the, on the debtors. Then um, during the, the, the well, after the, the, the COVID crisis, after 2020, let's say like that, there was an additional demand for capacity on some given name. I mean, there is an increasing demand to free up capacity on some large corporates whereby the, the banks are already um, providing a lot of support with loans, short-term uh, transactions, short-term facilities, and they would like to do more with this large corporate, and they need to distribute some part of the risk so that they can do more. And this is what we experienced in, uh, in 2021, for example. And last but not least, obviously, as Katie said already, um, there is a, a demand or there is a need to free up RWAs, meaning that there is a need for regulation or wording which is compliant with the regulation. And this is now a must in the, in the support that we are giving to, to banks. Obviously, there are newcomers uh, in, uh, in our global scope, uh, such as asset manager or fintechs. Asset managers are stepping in this kind of uh, um, transaction because they are looking for yield. And obviously, receivable transaction, short-term receivable transaction, is a good um, product to, uh, to get some additional yield. And fintechs, because they are trying to fill the gap where the banks are unable or don't want to go. I mean, to source some difficult credit or to fund some difficult transactions. And so they are trying to agglomerate, in a way, some large transaction or large portfolio and find a way to enhance the risk via insurance and to distribute the risk to the banks via a kind of SPV or securitization-like transaction. And so, again, the, the demand is moving from the classic need to a more sophisticated risk or to something that is more in terms of support to, uh, to the banks. No, no, I just have to say, I'll be fair to FinTechs. I don't think it's they going where banks don't want to go. Um, I think that's a bit unfair. I'm working with quite a few FinTechs and some of the risks they, they send across my desk are or on par with what the banks send us. So uh, I think they're looking to to make the transactions a lot quicker, particularly uh, for e-commerce business, uh, for some SME business. Um, but but I have some, uh, you know, I think they're looking to take the uh, take the make make the transaction easier for the customer. And I think that's what we all need to do. So I, I, I yeah, I don't think it's just they're going where others don't want to go. And the same way with private equity, I see them uh, bringing some nice risk to the market. Sometimes their shareholder wants to take credit risk. Sometimes they say no. So, uh, but sometimes the the quality is very very good as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The digital world is something that making uh, things going more quickly. And sometimes it's a disruptive solution. Sometimes it is not, it's, it is just a question of being, uh, of proposing something more easy to the, to the client. You're definitely right, I mean, I mean, sometimes going to a bank, unfortunately is a bit uh, difficult because you have to uh, pick and choose the right bank, the right product, the right solution. Whereas going to the FinTech, they can, as a broker, in a way, um, facilitate the, the whole transaction. And this is where the broker, to me, are extremely good at it for, for the time being. They are uh, really uh, a good support to uh, SMEs or large corporate to find the right set of solution, banking solution and insurance solution. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. I think banks have been working with us as an industry for the last 20, 25 years. I think what's changed, as you write, they used to be as a loss payee and sit. And, and what I mean by that is when the event of a claim, we would pay the bank first. And the banks have really changed their position now where they've become the insured. And, and I think there's two reasons. We talk about RWA, absolutely. But I also think the bank just wants to have greater control of the policy. And, and my advice to them is you, you should be insured in a, in a number of cases. You then know the premiums paid. And therefore, that gives you greater confidence. You're, you know how the policy works. And it means you get your claims payment a lot quicker, better, and more transparent. So I think banks have seen and become knowledgeable. But to, we've been working together probably the last 25 years. And banks have said, OK, 
not only capital relief, I want to have greater control over this this uh, this asset that I'm insuring, greater knowledge, um, and therefore they've developed specialists and brokers have come along to the table as well and advise them of that as well. So, so I think yeah, it's been a real explosion of growth over the, the last few years. I'd say the bank business to the market probably since COVID is is grown by twenty um, percent plus. Um, so I think we've been better at positioning our products. Banks have been better understanding the products. And so I see that very much continuing. Marilyn, where do you see supply and demand issues? Um, obviously, I know talked about explosion of growth. Is there is there enough supply for that growth? Where do you see expectations on, on both sides and are they being met? Yeah, it's it's a good point and and certainly relevant to to the discussion just now. Um, you know what we see is that demand from FI clients and their brokers is increasing more and more, and I think that is due to many reasons explained so far. Um, but certainly, I put them into three main buckets um, that are more kind of product oriented. So there's a request for a wider array of credit products to be covered. And, and Katie and JM have, have touched on this. Um, for us, for example, corporate loans is something that we traditionally um, didn't cover and, and we, we now cover. And, and that's driven by demand, um, requests from our bank clients and our financial institution clients to cover more assets. Um, we're seeing that also with special purpose loans, which is driven by the E, S, and the G, uh, where we're seeing um, all sorts of uh, types of purposes that um, have that connection, um, but but are, again, just corporate loans and credit risks that we can get comfortable with. So that's the first reason, is just a wider array of credit products. The second one is the need to help the trade finance gap, uh, which, of course, is, is a lot SME-driven. Um, it's driving more demand for um, eligible eligibility driven portfolios, uh, which we've already touched on with things like securitizations, um, but equally, it's not just about fintechs coming to us, it's it's banks using data better than they've been able to in the past to enable us to then help them with their portfolios, um, either partnering with a fintech or just through their own systems. So we're seeing a, a lot of that driver of helping the trade finance gap. Um, and in that one, I wouldn't say it's just SME risk that we're covering. It can also be supply chain finance deals where it's strong banks in certain setups, particularly with um, development banks or um, strong corporates that are helping get to the tail suppliers that we all so desire um, to support. Um, so that's kind of item two. Um, the third one, and it's of course very topical, is supporting the energy transition. And that's now got a whole new flavor given uh, the, the volatility in, in energy and, and the geopolitical climate. Um, but again, the demand there is pushing us to think about things like carbon certificate prepayment deals, which we wouldn't have thought of before that we're now um, covering. Construction of green projects, mining of transitional minerals. These are all things that are becoming much more the standard and really demanded by clients. So I would say that's the demand picture. From the supply side, insurers are coming to the table. Um, more and more, we're, we're trying to support uh, these types of products that perhaps we haven't um, in the past. And everyone has said capacity is strong. Um, there are a few things, of course, that impact um, supply uh, that we have to think about. Um, one is price. Uh, there's often that kind of transition to, to, to the bottom, to the lowest price possible. But I think we all have to think about sustainability of price. And we've seen some exits um, of competitors in the market that have been really profitability driven, not because of big claims, but profitability. You know, are, are they making enough? And um, so I think that's something we have to think about, especially as uh, probably all of us would agree, many of our managements expect in hard markets that prices improve and we get that profitability buffer um, or, you know, at least alignment. Yet, Jean-Maurice will probably tell us the banks aren't always getting hard market adjustments to prices. So, you know, price on the supply side does impact. Um, another thing uh, perhaps that's useful to think about is capacity. So there are always going to be names where the market starts to hit up against capacity. But more and more, I believe as a market, we can improve utilization. And this is, you know, the client side, the broker side, and the insurer side. We can all try to think of better ways to make sure where there's a limit out there on an obligor, is it being utilized so that we can spread the love, if you will. 
Um, so those are really the, the demands and supply summaries. So wider array, of right, wider array of credit products, helping the trade finance gap, supporting the energy transition. And then on the supply side, we're there. We want to support these deals. Um, let's just keep an eye on price and utilization to try to support that more. And of course, the geopolitical mindset. Uh, that's that's serious. <laughs> Maybe if I, if I may, uh, Audrey, on the, the, the pricing, since uh, Marilyn mentioned that, I mean, it is true. It's, there's often on the loan side, you know, and depending on the sub-segment, uh, uh, there are still far too many banks, you know, and we, we, we see too much liquidity on the cash side, you know, willing or being thrown at, at corporates when... Uh, and we end up with margins uh, that are probably not risk adjusted in the eyes of insurers and insurers you know they judge deals on their own merits they they don't have the the relationship angle that some banks have and so they're they're having to pass on what we see as good business still uh, because it's just not priced correctly in the in a view so that yeah that's that's going to be a perennial problem uh, that will continue, I think. I know you were, you were nodding your, your head a couple of times. Yeah, at look, I, What's your perspective on the competitive landscape? I mean, look, we, we all sit here with pretty low claims ratios for the last three years. And, you know, when, when three years ago, our shareholders said there's going to be a wave of claims, they never came. So we all have high reserves. Uh, I think with banks as well, you're right, they are coming to us and saying, um, we need to be competitive. It's an important client for us. And as we get more business with banks, we certainly able then to say, okay, we'll support you on this deal and, and we'll lower our margin on this deal. So I think, I think that's, that's what we've had to do as a business. But I think, uh, you know, we're now hitting a recession. Some should argue, okay, prices should go up, but then I still sit there and look at my competitors and our reserves. They're, all, they're at record highs. So I still think it's going to be a pretty soft market. Uh, unfortunately, for the next years. And then also, you've got to add to that, the insurance has got better data now. I mean, Marilyn mentioned that, you know, we started to do risks that we hadn't done before. But that was because we just got better data from our banks. They gave us more information. They sat down. We understood the product. And so I'd argue we have expanded our, our product portfolio. But I think it's just we've had the time to sit with them. And the broker's been instrumental in that and saying, look, you say you don't do loans. You say you don't do these products. But let us explain. And then when we've explained and shared data, I think the risk we've taken is good. So uh, you're right. I think that's that's been a testament to to the market and, and the interaction between the brokers, insurance and banks. Um, the more transparency and understanding, the more we're going to align on, on these uh, pricing topics and capacity topics and new products. Mm. And if, if I may, uh, based on what you said, Anil, definitely you are right. Dealing with the right bank with the transparency we're expecting is key for us to support the transaction and to set the right pricing. And the pricing is not just a question of, um, of uh, market pricing, it's also a question of capacity in terms of cost of capital and reinsurance cost. And for over the last three or five years, in terms of reinsurance, we get a lot of support from reinsurance. Unfortunately for the reinsurance market, because of natural catastrophes, there is a big hit. And so there is, there is a question mark for the coming up two or three years. Would the reinsurance capacity still be there or not? Or would the pricing is going up? And so how to absorb the, the, the reinsurance cost and the capital cost uh, for the, the trade credit insurance? That, that's a, a big question for the coming months and years. And there are still a lot of, um, of uh, storm cloud gathering. I mean, not only on the range on side, but the, the global economy, obviously. So we are trying to factor into our pricing also, not the past claim, but the future claims. And this is where we are struggling a bit, as you said, Daniel, with our key clients, trying to explain that, okay, guys, we were profitable, but be careful because in the next few months, that's going to be extremely difficult. And we need to have a balanced relationship as of, as of today. So this is a difficult negotiation with our clients, 
But over the last two or three years, especially in 2020, when we had to explain the end of the world because of the COVID crisis, uh, it, it was a real partnership with our key clients. Uh, and we, we had daily calls, weekly calls. We were trying to adapt the global exposure. We are trying to give back the exposure to our clients so that, again, transparency, trust, is really stronger than ever between our clients and the, the insurance. Jean-Marie. Yeah, I would add, since we talked quite a bit about pricing, about soft markets or hard markets, and, and uh, Laura mentioned clouds on the horizon, I wanted to, you know, uh, to, to mention another potential Damocles sword over our head, which is Basel IV. And, and that could have an impact. It, it could also lead to a very um, positive scenario whereby all, all banks are subject to that, uh, do have to um, up their pricing and then insurers uh, surf on that wave and benefit from higher pricing uh, because of uh, th that will be the impact of the regulation. That of course assumes that the real economy can take it uh, if they can't, you know, then there'll be some hard choices again, and uh, and it could impact the various constituent parts of the of our little ecosystem here. I, you know, I wouldn't say it's a le little ecosystem because our ecosystem has a massive impact on the economy. I mean, you you know, yeah, uh, yeah. and so I think uh, you're right. I think the regulation. We've got to work with them because ultimately now is a more time when when we we enter the recession. Uh, we're supporting millions and millions of companies from SMEs to large corporates with the facilities we're writing and, and the project finance deals and the trade loans we're supporting. So I think uh, I think it could have a significant impact unless we carry on working well as we have over the last 20, 30 years. So uh, I think it's a critical time for us. And, yeah. and that, that's where I think some of the, the, the data that we've been accomplishing and and also the I think a really good working partnership I mean Laurent mentioned the the key working partnership between the banks and their insurers on the transactional side but I think it's also important to mention that I think there's been a really good partnership in terms of facing up to some of these broader issues that affect both industries in a much more coordinated fashion and that's due to I think some very good working relationships between ICISA and other uh, insurance organizations and ITFA and other banking organizations in terms of facing facing up to these these issues. Um, Jean-Michel, I guess I wanted to um, follow up on, on the point about partnership and, and since you've been a, a long time successful, correct me if I'm wrong, user of the, of the product, um, perhaps talk about sort of how how you made it work in your bank and what what advice would you give hopefully some of the people in the audience are not yet users of the product but are, are interested in, in in finding out more about what how to make it work internally from a bank perspective sure sure audrey so i i think um this is kind of the advice to to new entrant uh, kind of chapter um the first thing i, I would make four points. Um, it's not as long as uh, Katie's list. But, <laughs> um, first point is you you gotta you gotta create a central team. You gotta set up the face to the market for your institution uh, because insurers um, want to see the commitment of that institution to 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 themselves. And um, and, and as Laurent mentioned uh, in passing, um, insurers underwrite as much the insured as the underlying transactions. So that first step of setting up a, a central team, however small, is, is pretty key. The second thing is that it, there is also a lot to do for that team, uh, not only to, um, you know, um, manage and develop those relationships with the insurers even though a lot of the transaction uh, the transaction volume goes through brokers insurers are keen to to know who they're dealing with so that's uh, that's that but also um, there's work to do internally in terms of setting up secondary limits in terms of negotiating 
uh, wording, looking at the capital relief or not that you may get, and 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 bringing the whole bank and various support functions along uh, with that. So it, you definitely need people, and you can't really get by with um, a patchwork of deal teams in their sectors who only care about their own little deal. You, you need somebody to coordinate all that. And then the risk, that's the third uh, point, the risk becomes that you get completely overwhelmed with data. So you need good organizational skills. Uh, you can start with an Excel sheet. And we've we've uh, uh, made do with that for a long, long time. And then you, you may need to invest in a, in a better system. Uh, to to track all the, the the premium paid and the and the limits used and so forth, and then fourthly, uh, even if you've done all that, um, you still have quite a bit of operational risk embedded in that product, and that never goes away. And what I mean by that is the in life management of the of all these covers. Um, on a multi-year basis, you know, you will have a lot of waivers, a lot of uh, uh, changes uh, happening. Uh, the premium needs to be paid. That's pretty basic, but uh, you will wonder <laughs> uh, how many teams forget about that. So there's a lot of education, constant education or monitoring to make sure you do not fall foul of the policies and the various obligations you you took up as um, as insured so yeah so it's a, it sounds like a lot but it's well worth it as you heard from kt uh, it's a whole new channel compared to uh, what banks are maybe used to like uh, having a syndications desk they are probably more productive or more efficient ways to set it up um, there's lots of talk in our market about portfolios, about um, uh, significant risk transfers, etc. And, and uh, I'll return the compliment. Texel has invested a lot in, in that. And, and I've got some really good people to advise uh, banks on how to get the biggest bank for their buck, you know, and that, that's what SRTs do. Um, on, and they can be used on a non-funded basis with insurers. So that there are many, many ways to do this, maybe in a more programmatic way, uh, you know, rather than line by line, loan by loan, or receivable by receivable. Uh, but it's um, uh, that you may need a bit of sophistication as well to, to get to that level. And I think that it's it's not a waste of time to, to to provide that advice to the newer users because I know I was three weeks ago I was in Latin America and there was a lot of interest from from banks in that region and discussions going on with their regulators about the use of credit insurance by banks and the Loan Market Association told me in the context of a project we're working on that there's an enormous amount of demand from people who haven't traditionally used the product so we could we could see an explosion of that demand potentially so uh, having having the right approach i think is key but perhaps one of the insurers wants to comment on that because you know how much the the bank and its organization or attitude or approach impacts how you work with them and how willing you are to work with them yeah maybe just from a personal experience i mean i started in in the uk market and and we had a lot of business with banks and then i remember going to the middle east and you really have to knock on every door and then i went to asia uh, spend some time there so i think you know what we need to do is is literally yeah if you want to go to brazil we need to persuade one of our team to go and the brokers need to go as well and it is a long time educating and and and, and taking to the next level it, it's no coincidence the markets that uh, are really adopt this product are the markets where maybe uh, people have gone out there and shared that knowledge so we need to share it i think it's easy now with tools like webex and now we're back to traveling it, it's great that we can get out there but we need to knock on the door of the banks, the regulators, the large trade finance uh, users and educate because because as, as Katie mentioned earlier, the product works and, and you know, it, it, it enables economies. I mean, economies that trade well, create more jobs, create a better lifestyle, create more opportunities. So we need to get out. And, and you're right. There's no no the economies that use trade credit insurance and use trade credit. It works. So I think um, it's it's about I'm, I'm maybe a bit too old now, but uh, maybe someone needs to go to Brazil and, and sit there permanently and, 
educate the market. But uh, alas, not my time. <laughs> but yeah, maybe to, to, to add something on that, uh, we have to be careful about the cultural difference. I mean, dealing with risk in Latin America is different from dealing with risk in Western Europe. And it's also true for the US, for example, uh, because uh, taking the risk uh, from a banking perspective in the US is something more popular than in, uh, in Western Europe. So you can have different mindset locally. And so you have to be careful about that because the same product can be used differently in different geographies. So that's very important. And as you said, Annie, we, we have to go there and to meet people, to understand the culture and to under, understand the credit management procedure, as well as the local law. I mean, uh, dealing with a receivable in Brazil is not the same as dealing with a receivable in France, for example. So again, this, this kind of specificities, you have to be aware of that and you have to adapt or amend the way you are dealing with your client locally. And sometimes uh, we were wrong uh, when thinking that a large Asian bank, for example, is doing the same as a large US banks with short-term receivables. That's not true. So again, being careful about that, being aware of the way of dealing with risk is really important. And then, as we said already, building up trust with the local teams and being, being sure about what they are doing. And sometimes dealing with claims is really important to know each other and to be there for the long term. Yeah, no, I, I would echo the same and just say that um, it's critical for us all to go into deals as partners. And so getting to know each other, getting to know the motivations um, and, and really great submissions so that everyone goes into deals with a transparent view of I'm covering this risk, you're sharing this risk. And that's where uh, we love uh, when, when brokers like Katie um, you know, share these really great submissions that really touch on all the things that both sides care about so that Jean-Maurice gets the cover he expects and that we're covering uh, the, the, the trades that we understand. And that's when you get a great outcome. And as Laurent said, uh, great claims experience as well, which our industry has proven happens again and again. So it comes down to that partnership. Yeah. yeah, I think banks are global, and so we need to get global as well. So our, our banks are going to these markets, and we need to be there. I, I saw India open recently with, with banks, and so we need to be there working and finding solutions and, and understanding the culture uh, quickly. We're already there for, for our normal teams are there, our day-to-day, -day, so we need to go there as well. So, uh, yeah, that's the challenge. Maybe one more, one more little word, if I may. But, and it's something I, you know, I haven't been doing uh, this job, which is buying credit insurance for ING for for a long, long time, uh, only since 2013. And it's I'm always surprised how um, you know willing insurers are to pay claims, how much more. Um, uh, expecting of losses they are than banks, you know, when they go into a, a deal, you know, they, they, they're braced for, for that first, whereas banks uh, really hope to get their money back always. <laughs> and, uh, and it's been a breath of fresh air for me, you know, having worked in, in, in real estate or in LBO and more, much more transactional uh, kind of environments to see the appetite for relationships and the the the, the willingness to um, you know go along with uh, with uh, with banks on on sometimes very difficult deals. Jean, you're very kind to say that as a, an insurer. But to be fair, we say if, if we're not claim, paying claims, then we're just not relevant. I mean, as as trade credit insurer, no, I'm realistic. I mean, my customers say, you know, as trade credit insurers. You have to be paying a certain amount of claims you know it goes back into the economy so i would love the fact that you know but i worry the other way around if we're paying nothing then what is the relevance of us in trade credit insurance so i agree right. we've got to get the balance right for our yeah. our shareholders uh we've got to get balance right for our reinsurers but we also need to get the balance right for for our clients as well so um so yeah thank you for that but uh, <laughs> uh i need to stay relevant <laughs> 
And it was good that Jean-Marie said that banks always like to get their money back because that also it enhances the partnership because the, the banks are working on behalf of the insurers who have paid claims to make sure that the recoveries mean that it continues to be a successful product. Well, we're hoping to get some questions for the audience. So can I just ask for any last comments from you know, each of the um, panel members, any any last comments on, on why use uh, credit insurance if you're a financial institution? I thought I'm, I might just add some points on, you know, best practice. Jean-Marie's made some really good points about how you uh, manage uh, your policies within a bank, but just maybe to, to add uh, to some points too on the broking side. Um, I think it's really important. And I think a few people have mentioned it as well as that information sharing. It's, it's really good if you can share credit memos, write ups, uh, be really transparent, educate the underwriters because they're just so willing to look into new areas, um, do new deals. There's been a, a big growth in the project finance space, uh, lots of areas, renewables and digital infrastructure, which is really exciting. And the underwriters uh, are learning uh, uh, alongside the, the banks. So the education process is really important. That transparency, even telling them why the bank's looking to buy insurance, that, that that's great. It creates that trust. And um, like jean marie says about understanding your policy and the operational requirements and, and that that's important. But the brokers actually does quite a bit of work there to, to help you. Uh, get you to understand the, the product and, and to manage it accordingly. Great. Well, Katie, you, and maybe you, just to say yeah. that, yeah, look, I was going to say, look, you know, we're in a bit of stagflation at the moment and the only way out of it is to create growth. I think when, when insurers and uh, trade, trade credit insurers and banks, trade banks work together, that creates growth. So more than ever now, I'd urge a bank to, to internally start and, and look, and I think you gave some great advice, Jean Maurice, about how to start. Um, so I think it's, yeah, if you haven't started, start, and if you're doing it, continue. Fantastic. Um, any last comments? Otherwise, we'll uh, turn it over to the uh, sure. audience and hopefully get some questions. But I wanted to make sure everybody had a chance for their, their last. Maybe, maybe just three words. Uh, first, I would say transparency, then partnership, and then trust. These are the cornerstone of our relationship and our support to banks. I, I will um, end with one word, partnership. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's an excellent way to, to, to end. So thank you all very much. And hopefully we'll get some questions for the audience. Hopefully we've given people lots to think about, but um, we started off by saying it's a product that works. I think we should also end that way. I think the, the numbers speak for themselves. I think the increasing demand for the product work speaks for it as well. But um, it really is something that, um, as Jean Marie said, when you get into it, you realize just how integral it is to, as Anil says, the economy and, and how it works. So um, thank you all very much. And we will look to hopefully get some questions from the audience to keep explaining this. Thank you. Okay, that was great. Um, thank you everyone for, for participating in that. And uh, as you can see, we've got many of our panelists uh, here with us today. Um, thank you all again for that. I think I forgot to mention, I'm Daniel DeBurk. I'm the head of public affairs of ICESA at the start. So um, just to give people who weren't sure who I was uh, uh, the heads up about that. We actually did get quite a few questions um, that came in during that, uh, which is great to see. Uh, one, uh, there was quite a few questions about Basel IV and uh, some of the new uh, banking rules as they're evolving. And actually, I was I was wondering, Jean Maurice, if I could ask you quickly. We're seeing uh, uh, there's there's a, an ongoing review in the EU um, of of the banking rules here, um, and and a part of that is considering the way that credit insurance is used by banks. What what's the sort of the status on those discussions, and what kind of things are are you looking for in in those discussions? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Uh, do, do, do you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, 
uh, yeah, I'm working um, uh, under the umbrella of another trade association called ITFA, uh, alongside a number of the other uh, panelists here, uh, Katie, Audrey, uh, Anil, and then um, yes, we, we we're um, uh, we've struck a number of victories, I must say, through a lot of engagements to date, um, notably a. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but an, an enabling clause which puts for the first time credit insurance on the map. Uh, and that uh, came into um, a draft uh, CRR by the Commission back in October. Uh, we've also managed to get support for a number of amendments to it uh, that are favorable to, to the industry uh, from some parliaments. Uh, some members of uh, the European Parliament, and and now we're working also with the the Council, so member states, to make sure they're aligned to to the the, the Parliament's thinking, uh, so that there's less and less uh, discussion uh, in the new year between uh, what is usually called the trilogue, so the, the dialogue between the Commission, the Parliament, and the uh, um, and the member states, the Council. Uh, Daniel knows this a lot better than I do. Uh, we've had to learn uh, by doing here, uh, but yeah, I, you know, we're hopeful that there will be a recognition of the product, and at some point, uh, a better treatment, and pending that, uh, some transition arrangements to uh, buffer the the change, which otherwise would have been would be pretty drastic if uh, if nothing had happened so i'm i'm very grateful to all the 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 brokers the uh, the insurers the other banks the trade associations everybody that has funded the effort uh uh with our lobbyists in brussels to 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 achieve something which um, um was not obvious initially yeah I think it's 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 also a challenge when you are a lesser known part of the sector or part of the financial services industry, making people aware of how the product works, making people aware of who you are, I think is always a, a challenge to start with. But I think True. as Anil said during the conversation, we, we play a very big role in uh, supporting trade and uh, getting things moving again. So I, I think there's a real positive there that yeah. we can we can tell our story about. It's true on the on the loan side, there's always been that sort of culture that um, uh, insurers are behind the banks, operating a little bit behind the scenes, and therefore I think it translated into um, an attitude whereby we we didn't want to um, you know put our head above the parapet, which is I think at the end of the day counterproductive. Whereas trade credit uh, uh, insurers uh, like Laurent and Anil were more in the in the limelight uh, which which therefore triggered more support uh when when it was needed or perceived to yeah. be needed i should say um another sorry audrey are you do you have anything to add there oh no i was actually just going to give ic a credit because one of the issues we always have is that banking regulation at least to date has really focused on the um you know guarantees and and uh, and derivatives whereas credit insurance is neither of those things and so what, what we see sometimes is that the regulations have inadvertent consequences on a product that works because it's insurance and it hasn't been recognized and as uh, Jean-Maurice is saying that's that's one of the things we're hoping will come out of this but um, I wanted to highlight ICESA's efforts as well because there have been some text changes that could have had a, a very bad impact on, on the, the multi-buyer, the whole turnover product that I think you've you managed to highlight and help educate. Um, so I think I think it's, it's important to recognize just how, mu how much effort this has taken. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a team effort and I'm, I'm glad we have a pretty good team across the industry of people trying to, to make a positive impact, I think. Um, another really interesting looking question that, that came in, and perhaps this is one for Laurent and, and Anil as well, is, um, is, is about the, the databases. How important are broad databases uh, on buyers and companies for banks thinking of cooperating with credit insurers? What do you think of that? So maybe then I'll, I'll go first. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're looking at our database today, 
around about 95% of our of our buyers that we look at, um, we automate. So we're using data and we've been using AI for 10 years and, and, and using the latest data available. I think when you're looking at the, the exposure though, it's still quite a relatively low level exposure. So still a third of our exposure, so two thirds of our exposure, it's, it's probably a human being looking at that data. So I think the database is important, but having the people there I think one of the questions is about, do we understand some of the risks as well? I mean, we have a lot of people from banking backgrounds as well. So when we're looking at long, long-term, mid-term tenors, um, project finance deals, uh, energy deals, then we tend to recruit people from banks who have that specialism. But yes, uh, I would sometimes say we're a data company who's selling insurance rather than an insurance mm. company with data. Yeah. And maybe we can- They're on it. Yeah, we can make the Sorry, link to one of the question in the chat regarding Africa. And because this is key, I mean, information in Africa is poor for the time being. So it's difficult for, for us to underwrite some risk. Even though there are good initiatives, Africa Bank, for example, is pushing strongly to, in that way, trying to build up a kind of a global database. And based on that, we will have more information so we will be able to support banks locally. And um, as you said, and in most of the information that we are getting, we are using it automatically, but this is not where are uh, the largest risk. And where we have to really support our key clients, meaning banks, we have to have some people behind the machine to, uh, to support the risk and to understand the risk, the debtors, the um, transaction, and we have to underwrite the bank as well. Yeah, and uh, Katie, where do you see things going when it comes to project financing as well? There's there's obviously a lot going on out there. What what's what's your sense of the market at the moment? I think it's a really increasing part of our, our business, actually, yeah, the project finance deals. And I think underwriters originally, you know, got comfortable very much with uh, the the data center deals and the fiber transactions, but they're, they're really trying to expand their book and look at renewables. There's even an underwriter called Tierra, who's just solely looking at renewable project finance transactions. Texel, last year, we actually conducted a survey with underwriters and we found that, we get, get my numbers right, 26 underwriters are currently um, can provide support on project finance transactions. And there's a theoretical maximum of 1.2 billion that they could provide per transaction with average line sizes about 17 million so it's, it's a really exciting part of our business and they do have the expertise a lot of ex-bankers are coming into our market and supported by analysts in the background i think we've probably got time for maybe a final comment i think one of the things that you all mentioned was partnership how best can you achieve partnership that's i suppose fair competitive and uh, and works for client and insurer who wants to go first? Maybe Anil, do you have a thought on that? Well, I think I think associations like ICESA, I think are great at bringing us together, uh, debating topics um, and, and, and working out uh, solutions together. So I think uh, I think face-to-face -face communication is still a must. It's still, uh, so I think sitting down uh, with brokers, banks, partners, um, having a dialogue. Um, and as I said, the way the market's evolved and covering risks, um, with knowledge and sharing, we've got to continue that partnership. Joe Maurice, from your side, what, what works? Um, what works, I, th I think, yeah, a lot of dialogue with insurers directly, even though uh, a lot of the market is brokered, uh, I think insurers uh, like to see what they, who they transact with and, uh, uh, and it doesn't circumvent the broker at all. Uh, the broker has got his space, but I, I think yeah, the more, pro, the more, uh, the more insurance procurement looks like reinsurance, the better I think, uh, in terms of productivity, efficiency, and uh, and relationship. At the end of the day, Audrey, maybe if if you have any final thoughts, and we'll we'll wrap up the session. I think the the. The key is, is education, it's that communication, it's it's really focusing on explaining the product better, whether it be to a banking regulator, to an insurance regulator, explaining that partnership and just how important it is for 
the real economy we're all operating in, in in the real economy and we really need banks to continue to lend so so anything that uh, that facilitates understanding of a product that i think really works i think is key um it, it, it's it's a it's a product that's grown in depth uh we have project finance we have huge demand for receivables finance and anything and everything you can think of in between it's really a product i think that's kind of grown in in breadth but also in depth of understanding and that's that's something i think that that we just all need to continue to work to 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 facilitate great i unfortunately we can't get back to any to, to many of the more questions but there were a ton of questions there so i think maybe we need to do more sessions like this in the future <laughs> But um, thank you all very much for taking part. In particular, big thanks to Audrey for chairing the, the panel discussion itself. Um, we, thank this, you. this finishes Trade Credit Insurance Week today. We're taking a break tomorrow, uh, and we're back on Wednesday. We've got two discussions on Wednesday. The, the first uh, is about the changing nature of trade. So, so there's lots of things happening in the world today and impacting trade. And how does that impact the, the sector that, that we're here to talk about today? So that discussion will, will take place in the morning. That's 10, uh, 10 a.m. Central European time. So please adjust your clocks accordingly for that. And then in the afternoon, we've got a discussion on uh, current trends and evolution in the TCI market. Um, again, another really interesting one, a lot happening with um, uh, the, the, the creation of managing agents, uh, a, a, a lot of um, new technology, a lot of different uh, trends that, that we're starting to see emerging in the market. So that should be a really interesting conversation. Again, that's at the same time as this, 1500 uh, Central European time. Again, please make sure you, you note the time zone in your own location. Um, so that just leaves us to say again, thank you to everyone who's taken part today. Uh, thank you to our panelists uh, and to our moderators. And thank you to all of the, the people who turned up. We, we've had a huge audience today and hopefully we can continue that throughout the week. So thanks again and goodbye.